we don't we we've never talked to each other or anything but what happened i'll just like uh i'll just explain a little bit of my story here this is i don't want this about it's not about me but uh, it might be of interest to you um maybe about eight or nine years ago i'd like some major kundalini events in my life from doing too much ayahuasca you could say um and um I started seeing demons in the real world. So that was exciting. Um, <laughs> right. And it was really, really scary. And I was having all kinds of crazy events moving into other dimensions. And I didn't know what was going on. And so I was looking for information, uh, trying to find ways um, to understand what was going on. And uh, one of the books I came across, I read thousands of books, but one of them was your book, uh enlightenment through kundalini Very I good. Think and um that is uh that became at the time a really useful book to me and um i mean since then i, I mean you've written quite you've written a number of books uh I've, i think i've read three of them now i've got the uh stairway to heaven i just finished reading your um uh higher consciousness healing book which was awesome uh, and simple, but I guess like what I'm interested in. I mean, I'm in, I'm interested in you, Tara. But like the uh, the uh, starting off because like a lot of my viewers like on YouTube know my story. I guess, and I got a small channel, but I got like a loyal following. I guess you know. But uh, so people know of all these crazy Kundalini stories of mine, and in particular for me, it was that book, Enlightenment Through Kundalini. That is a really good book, and it's, it, it does a really good job, I think, of like synthesizing a lot of um, a lot of information, and it does it in a really concise way. So, like a lot of Kundalini books, I mean, uh, Gopi Krishna has got like about fifty thousand pages, which you have to go through to find out about Kundalini. And what's cool about your book is that it's really um, it's concise, but it covers a whole lot of. Um, really important practices and it really sort of guided me at the time when i was reading it into um into thinking more about uh the chakras generally and uh i think at least at that time that was that seemed to be a big part of what you were talking about in particular i've written some notes here um in particular in that book you talk about um chakra diagnosis and chakra purification and um you do a, you it seems to me that you do a lot of like real world work with people like you actually do like therapy work with people who've gone through cursing demons and this kind of stuff or whatever you know and yes. um you've got like uh you seem to obviously you've you've had some big kundalini experiences yourself but what is your, um, how do you go about chakra diagnosis? Maybe that's a good place to start. Right. You know, uh, so just first of all, I want to say um, I've worked with over a thousand people who had a Kundalini awakening. I, I haven't stopped, you know, I stopped counting when I thought it was a thousand. It's, it's, it's a lot more now, but wow. you know an awful lot of people so all of what I'm saying is not just theory or my personal experience it is really based in real life with real people and um, so you know what I find is all these weird and wonderful kundalini experiences that people can have you know a sense of stuck energy a washing machine uh, you know head pressure heat up the spine you name it you know when you really look at them you can find that within all of this strange energy phenomena you can find actually that they are all related to emotions or you can even go so far to say there are emotions they're not really uh, you know seen as emotions or felt like emotions but you know the heat of the spine might be a sense of upset the um head pressure might be a feeling of not wanting to feel your shame the pressure in the shoulder could be, um, you know, a sense of repressed anger related to some sort of traumatic exp experience that you've had. And so that's basically how I work with people. You know, we go into these phenomena and we, we have a look at that. And I say, look at 
and you feel that pain, let's say in the shoulder. Um, and if you think if that was uh, an emotion, what would it resemble, resemble most strongly? Is it more like an anger or like a sadness or like an anxiety? And people find that generally quite easy to answer. And they say, well, it's definitely not anxiety. It might be a little bit of sadness, but I think it's anger. And then you say, okay, what does the anger want to say? Uh, this and this, you know, and um, and and then we 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 can relate it to real life experience, and so all of these experiences obviously are related to chakras. You know, so let's say uh, you know uh, experience in shoulders that could be related to the um, throat chakra or related to the heart chakra. The top of the shoulder is, belongs to the throat chakra. The, the lower part of the shoulder belongs to the heart chakra. So basically, you know, if you just, um, you know, see your body in segments and then the top segment, that's that's the head chakra, then comes the throat, throat chakra and the, uh, the heart chakra and so forth. And, uh, and every chakra has a certain theme, you know, you know, the head chakra has to do with um, how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we basically how we see things. And the throat chakra has to do with how we express ourselves and also how fair our relationships are. You know, there's a sense of um, is are things fair between us? Is there an equal give and take, or are we always in the position that we give more than others? That's to do with the throat chakra. And then the topic of the heart chakra is love and so forth. And so we can relate the different um, pains and en energy phenomena to different topics of the different chakras. And so um, you can say if you are able to have a positive or even blissful feeling in all of the six or seven chakras, depending on which system you're using, then, uh, and you keep it there, then uh, you, you are very far developed. I wouldn't say enlightened because maybe there's different stages of enlightenment. But, you know, that's what we're aiming for, to, uh, to be able to feel basically bliss in all of the chakras and to purify all the negativity, all the different attitudes or memories of ne negative experiences that we've had from the different chakras. And they're all stored, these memories are stored in our physical body. You know, in the right, right shoulder, we have some traumatic experience. In the left shoulder, we have, you know, some antisocial impulse <laughs> pressing. And, and so there's, our body is like a storehouse of um, memories, emotions that we kind of keep more or less repressed. And, you know, the person before the Kundalini uh, experience, for, for them, this repression is relatively easy. You know, I, I, I say they are like an ice block. I don't mean that in a demeaning way. It's just a useful metaphor to use. And then when we have the Kundalini uh, awakening, then this ice melts into water and the water is like emotions and then if we can transform these emotions then we can transform all the emotions into bliss so we have aggregate states you know ice water steam and if the ice is just a little bit melted so a little bit of slush going on that's what we experience then as pain or pressure of these strange uh, energy um, experiences that we can have now, it seems to me that like uh, in your books and what you're describing here is a lot of what you're doing is you're locating uh, consciousness inside of the body. Now, um, when I started off, like um, I basically got like an, a shamanic initiation, I guess. And after that, I became really aware of energy, like and it just like in one day, it was like, oh, my God, I know what this is. And um it was really strange but like a lot of practices um and you'll know this uh center upon like uh becoming aware and moving energy like through the body and this kind of thing i noticed like in in a, i think in all the three books that i've read of yours um you talk about um really about, i think the word you used I'm, i've written down my notes here was what you were saying is you were speaking against mental effort and manipulation of energy 
And what you were trying to say, I think, in your books is that it's much, it's more important rather than moving energy, it's more important to be observant of, it's, it's more the sort of state of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Observing is more important than manipulation of energy. So actually sort of like being aware of what's happening in your body rather than moving energy. Would you think that's true or no? Yes, I mean, the, the goal is that we learn to master our energy system. You could also say to control your energy, but lots of people have a problem with the word control. So I've, I use the word master it, you know. And, yeah. uh, you know, and this, this is a skill, a skill that can be, you know, learned and taught. And, you know, Qigong is one way of doing that. It comes from the Chinese system and then... I have my background is Tibetan Buddhism, so we have a little bit of a different way of doing things, but it goes in the same direction. And one one uh, important uh, thing when we work with energy is that we cannot use it like in the same way, like we we deal with matter. You know, let's say, let's say I have this cup here, and I want the cup to go to that direction, but I push it. And then I, I I lift it, you know. So that's how we deal with matter. And when we try to do the same thing with our inner energy, that, that doesn't work. It's a different. You need to have a different technique, so to speak. And let's just say you have a head pressure. Lots of people in the Kundalini process develop head pressure. So then they say, oh, this energy, too much energy in the head, it's got to be come, come down and push and pull and have some ideas of pulling, <laughs> and that will never work, you know. And um, so energy follows thought. So if you place your mind, let's say, on the heart, and you do a lot of heart loving kindness, then naturally all the energy comes down to the heart, basically because you're strengthening it. A safe way to put your energy, the safest place in the energy system is um, the navel. That, that can store the most of the energy. So basically, if you do a lot of navel work, then the, the head pressure that comes uh, comes down naturally. So that was my point, you know, don't go about this in a, in a matter as if you would move a pile of wood from one place to the next. This is not how this works, you know, you have to use different, you need, need to understand the principles, how you, how you work with this medium of um, energy. And, you know, let's just say you would work differently with water and with wood, you cannot do with water that you can do with wood and you cannot do what you do with wood or water that you can do with energy so they all need different techniques it's and, interesting um, it's interesting you've mentioned the uh, water and wood and ice and um one of the things that became a huge part of my practice is focusing on like the classical elements like a fire water air and earth and like really focusing on those as um you know, I didn't know what they were when I started thinking about them, but it turns out that they're like the building blocks of consciousness, I guess. And, um, and that being able to, like being able to focus my mind in different ways to try and observe, the, I, don't wanna, I don't like to use the word vibration, but to observe those different sort of vibrational states, um, it seemed like it was really important. Now, I don't, remember reading about you talking about the elements in your books but it sounds to me like you're talking about it here you're talking about different ways of handling different types of energy and i'm wondering when when you're helping people uh who've got problems what part one of the interesting things to me is like when i started learning about energy a huge thing seemed to be the imagination and like i found like by using my imagination it was like I could do anything. It was like I could move energy anywhere. But I've noticed that a lot of, and I'm not an expert, but I think you are, is that um, a lot of Buddhist meditators or Vipassana, they have this sort of more observational state. They don't, sometimes at a certain level, they, it seems like maybe they don't take the imagination seriously and they see it as like an obstacle, just a pure, the pure observation of what the, of what the body or what the uh of what energy is actually doing so my question is is like what, what role do you see imagination playing in the um in the balancing of the energy body yeah so there's 
there is various different branches of um, Buddhism when they have spread out in the whole East Asian, you know, place. Yeah. And, um, and there are certainly branches of Buddhism that don't go uh, in with a lot of visualizations and imagination you're right with that but my branch of buddhism which is tibetan buddhism they're doing an awful lot of visualizations and imaginations so we were really strong on that you know we visualized <laughs> very very much well that was and, one of the things i loved about your books because in like in in one of the, i think it was your book i think it was the um it was one part i remember reading it and you were talking about like um deity identification and That's like right. I, and like I, visualizing the deity and i can't remember the whole practice it was a long time ago but i remember trying it it was <laughs> it was unbelievable it was unbelievable what happened you know um but um, but, but obviously you have to use the visualizations in the in the right way if you kind of use a visualization to force things to be in a certain way that's missing the point the visualization is basically a stepping stone where you the idea of what actually the end product is of what you're trying to achieve and uh, and in a way you give your mind the idea of this is what we're aiming for but then you want this to be truly arising so for example you can visualize yourself as a deity and that can be very artificial and, and forced and even abused but if you are meditating in a certain way, then you will come to a point where you naturally arise as, the, as a deity. You experience yourself like that. You see yourself with all the ornaments and, and beautiful, and you know it is as if the deity is looking out of your own eyes. It is a, it's a very real, tangible experience. And if you have prepared the ground by, in a way, through the visualization, that you know this is where I'm going to arrive, then it feels in a way you're less likely to miss that when that's happening naturally and so really the visualizations is just you know a kind of you know a, a railing on which you hold yourself but really to go along is a different thing you know you have to arrive there naturally in, in, in the reality and the visualization is just a stepping stone towards that one of the things I remember, I was rereading the uh, the Enlightenment through Kundalini in the last in the last day, just trying to remember it because it was like an important book at the time when I read it, you know. And um, one of the things that's interesting about it is uh, you talk uh, you talk quite about about sexual energy, and this was like a big thing for me because when I suddenly became aware of energy, it was like it felt really sexual, and all of a sudden it was like I'd be thinking about my hand, and it'd be like I'm having an orgasm in my hand. What is going on? <laughs> right. And then I and then I'd be thinking about my big toe and it was like I'm having an orgasm. And it was crazy. And then sometimes the whole thing would coalesce and just and it'd be like it would be unbelievable. But I remember when I was reading your book, because when, when it started happening, I felt like sort of guilty or shameful. So you're like, this this can't I'm like, this can't be what enlightenment is all about. This can't can't be about this, you know. But then in your in your book, you um you actually um talk about how it's useful uh, to use that energy as uh, to guide as sort of as a guide or to um, to augment the sort of kundalini feeling now i came up against some really uh difficult problems with this too and uh, i don't know if you've probably met people who've had the same thing so i'm just going to run it past you and see what you say about this is I was using, well, I, I always sucked at meditation. I could never meditate until that shamanic initiation. And all of a sudden, because what I was doing is I was, I was focusing on the energy, which was explicitly sexual. So and what ended up happening is I, I ended up using the sexual object as a meditation, right? And so it was a purely meditative, meditational thing. Uh, and it was extremely powerful. Like how you were talking about the deity and you can see the deity covered with the jewels. I know exactly what that's about. But from time to time, what would happen is there would be complete and utter magnetic focus on meditation. But evil spirits would enter into the situation, vampires and demons. Um, and at the time, it, it was really, really, really frightening. Uh, because you think you're doing something which is all good. And yeah. uh, what's, 
what it seemed to me is I think, and this is what I tell people, is the problem is, is when you're dealing with sexual energy is most people have huge amounts of shame and guilt caught up with that. And so it seemed to me that what was happening is I was like, I was invoking this huge power, but I actually, by, but in my own psychological makeup, maybe it hadn't been purified yet. Do you think, and that's why those evil spirits were coming out. Is that something you've encountered with other clients, that kind of thing? Yes. Um, so basically using sexual energy for your spiritual path is a bona fide path in Tibetan Buddhism. It's called sexual yoga. And you can do it either with yourself or with the imagination of a sexual partner, which they call it consort, or you can do it with the person in the flesh, which are called action mudra. And um, so this is all well known and nothing to be ashamed of. But obviously, you can imagine it can be easily abused. So it's not something uh, they talk, talk about it a lot. But, you know, there are um, various books which speak about it quite openly and, you know, you can read about it. And, uh, you know, the enlightenment experience, it feels very blissful. And when you think, what is bliss? Bliss is something that is utterly um satisfying just like orgasmic experience is utterly complete that's the point of orgasm it is something that's completely satisfying and complete and if you imagine the sexual orgasm lasts i don't know 10 20 seconds but if you imagine the same quality of experience maybe not with an amplitude like this but with a smaller amplitude goes on for hours and hours or becomes your normal state of being then, then you, you come nearer to, to what we call enlightenment. And now people might say, yeah, yeah, but enlightenment is, is, not, uh, is not bliss. And, and, and they're right, it's not only bliss. I mean, there's also, we need a wisdom component. We need to understand, uh, you know, it's not just about feeling wonderful. It is also about understanding the nature of reality and yourself, but with, within the experience of bliss. And uh, there isn't there isn't another experience that is higher than that, and where you where you leave all the bliss behind you and come to something I don't know neutral or behind the bliss. No, what what the final end product is, it must be blissful. Otherwise, it can't be real because how can union with God or the union with, union with your you know deity anything else but blissful? And um, and that's why they use these these sexual practices to, to to help us to get to the taste of that. And uh, in the energy practices in Tibetan yoga, they're called Anu Yoga. And Anu Yoga, there's an explicit practice where you learn actually to have every move, movement. You know, your hand is moving, <laughs> your head is moving, and you are taught to feel all of these movements as sexual. Uh, energy you know very blissful very delightful and uh, and use that experience for deepening your your wisdom your understanding about who are you who is what is the nature of universe of the universe what is your ego how to let go of the ego and um without that bliss experience it's very very difficult to let go of your of your ego because i mean the ego is all you have you know your identity the, the stuff that you identify with but when you are in a, in a state of this enormous bliss for prolonged periods of time then you know your old identity oh i've had this childhood and i've got that profession all of that becomes irrelevant because the bliss is so all consuming and within that experience you become free to be anything that you want to be for example, the deity, and you can then, so to speak, upgrade <laughs> and, and adopt the enlightened self, the, the self with a capital S. Now, there's obviously a danger here because we can uh, get attached to this bliss. And uh, when you have wonderful, blissful experiences and then you stop your meditation and then you enter the real world, you can get very depressed or angry and the ordinary world can appear so mund mundane in comp comparison so that's a challenge if you if you uh, practice in this way or you can also get and get very megalomaniac you can get this 
these thoughts, you know, I feel good, so I must be good, and everybody must worship me now. So there's a danger there if you have a tendency in that direction. And so, but uh, once we overcome these challenges, this is the Tibetan Buddhist path. It is a path of bliss. This is the tantric path, you know, the tantric path means weaving it all together all the parts uh, of, the, of, of life, including sexuality. And, um, and, in, in, and it is including that bliss, and the bliss is felt in every chakra, including the sexual chakra, which we often also with our, you know, um, you know, ideas maybe that that's dirty and wrong and because we have maybe uh, sexual fantasies or action practices that are politically very incorrect. And then we, associate that with with shame but we can transform all of these things and we can we can feel that bliss in all the chakras and if you can do that consistently in your books is you talk about this um and this was this was actually really helpful to me because when i was having all those like sort of negative evocations of vampires vampires yeah i haven't i haven't talked about the, the 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 vampires shall i shall i answer that as well Oh yeah, if you've got something to talk about vampires, that's really because nobody understands what the hell I'm talking about. So if you can, talk oh yes, to yes, them. oh absolutely, I understand that. So <laughs> um, when we have the Kundalini awakening, I, I say uh, we have a consciousness expansion in four areas. The first is the opening of the own unconscious mind. That's where all the stuff uh, comes up, and then the un- we can also access the unconscious mind of other people better. We can, for example, sense more clearly what people are feeling, whether they're lying to us. Then, um, then the um, expansion into real um, spiritual experiences that we, for example, just talked about. And then another area that also expands is in the, in the area of the paranormal experiences. And there we have all, also all the CDs, which are the supernatural uh, um, abilities. So for example, spiritual healing, telepathy, uh, you know, clairvoyance, uh, ghosts, demons, visions, and so forth. Now, in, in, and here in the paranormal, we can also have experiences that are very scary, like seeing ghosts and vampires and God knows what. Now, th- there is a lot of reality around us that we don't see, and um, and therefore a lot of people deny and say that that doesn't exist. Um, I, I say that it's just like, colorblind people that want to tell us that colors don't exist (laughs) when you you see them then you say no they do exist orange blue and green vampires and ghosts yes they do exist (laughs) Uh, but the the point here is scott we we can we can talk about what paranormal experiences to have and when you particularly when you had your awakening with, with a form of substance or drug then this can be very uncontrolled and very frightening. And that makes an awakening with, with ayahuasca or something similar often more difficult to handle. And uh, because there's the influx of stuff is too rapid and uh, for many people difficult to handle. But uh, basically, if we don't like ghosts, we can tell our mind to say, look, I'm interested in spiritual healing, in clairvoyance, I want to know what other people are feeling and thinking in order to help them. And, uh, you know, various other things, um, talking to the deity, channeling, all oh, that's a good city to have. But ghosts, no, I'm not interested. I personally am not interested in ghosts. And secondly, I'm not interested in premonitions because I'm just also a, a, a mom and a, and a wife. And every time <laughs> my son is late and I have a premonition, he had now a car accident i don't want to think oh my god i've had a premonition so i've said to myself i'm not having any premonitions it's just not uh, you know I, I don't want that and so you can teach your mind not to have those experiences so i've i've had experiences with ghosts you know not not very many i think one particular and uh, one was enough and then i told my mind no more not interested in this and so the unconscious mind listens to us. The unconscious mind is a bit like a child. It doesn't listen to us the fir- first time. We tell it sometimes and we have to repeat it and say, no, no ghosts, no vampires, not interested. And then we have to take our um, 
mind away from those experiences and distract ourselves and switch the light on, watch the television and say, no, this is not what I want. And then gradually you will not have those experiences anymore because you can, you can control this. It does seem to be true. Like I've, I've been able to turn that stuff off quite a bit, mainly by changing my meditations in a lot of way. One thing I would say is like for a while, and I haven't had one for a, well, I get them still, but you know, like sometimes like I'll be sitting around like having a normal conversation. And then it's almost like there's like a, a trigger. Sometimes it's visual or whatever it is. And like, I'll look at something and there's a trigger and I have contact. All of a sudden there's like an aperture created into consciousness, which is so deep. It's so incredibly gobsmacking. Like you, it's just unbelievable. So like there was one time I was working on some artwork on the computer and I was choosing a color. It was sort of a, a, a yellowy green metallic color. And the moment I saw the color, it was like, boom. And I had this access into some alien race into, I don't know where. And it's just, it's, you know, and the thing is, it, it's not menacing. It's not like a menacing, I'm attacking you. It's just the knowledge, the depth of knowledge is it's it's just uh shattering it's shattering sometimes to see that stuff now the way i started dealing with some of these crazy experiences um was um if for what well, you know, a lot of it was based on trying to like analyze energy uh, elementally but then also in your books you talk a lot about um transformation of energy and um one thing I noticed just rereading your book yesterday and also re reading the healing, the conscious healing book recently is that you talk a lot about, um, it's almost like you're trying to find joy. It's like in the energy, it's almost like you're trying to, it's like you're trying to find like a positive joy inside the energy. Now, I'm not formally trained in meditation at all. I think of myself as a pretty advanced meditator, but nobody ever taught me. And so like, I probably missed a lot of like lessons which you'll learn in Buddhism. So for example, I was going through the elements like a fire, air, water, and earth. And I suddenly realized that the way I was doing it was, it seemed to correspond a lot with how people work with the jhanas. Like people use the jhanas as sort of, they're like states of consciousness you can sort of move into. But the funny thing about the jhanas is they seem to be, well, the lower jhanas seem to be based upon, um, well, it seems to me the first jhana is basically kind of like feeling the blissful energy and then moving into the second jhana is actually feeling joy. It's like becoming joyful about that feeling. And it seems to me that that seems to be kind of like your teaching is you're always sort of trying to find joy in the energy. Does that, does that sound about right or am I way off here? Um so that relates to the aggregates you know that we are numb then we are painful then we have negative emotions and then we learn to transform those negative emotions into steam and then we uh, but then we have bliss so it's you know i would call it uh, not not exactly finding joy in the experience but transforming the negative emotions into into joy or bliss that's basically what that is you know so we have the same energy that we Deal with and we can experience this energy as numbness as pain as uh, despair and as bliss it's the same energy just in a different we could say vibrational state and that's you, what we're going you, to do how would you go about doing that like, um, the way i did it is like i was using this sexual energy and i started having these negative evocations and so what i decided and this was partly based on some stuff i read in your books was I started going through this process of like, okay, I feel all this beautiful sexual energy, but then I'd go through a process of sort of loving forgiveness, like loving forgiveness of who I am and saying, listen, I'm not ashamed of this energy. I completely accept this. I completely accept who I am. And it felt really dumb at first. <laughs> like, it was like, cause I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy who's forgiving himself or whatever, you know, but, but what, but it seemed to be, that was what turned ice into steam. That's right. That's that's what happens. Well, very well done. <laughs> so without formal education, you, you did the right thing. So in Buddhism, we have like a four-tier system, you know, we, how we work with things. 
So there's the, the Theravada or Hinayana, they call it, where you simply observe th you, the content of your mind and you relax with that, you get to a peaceful state. And, um, and, and this is, you know, it just takes the edge of things, you know, it just helps you to step away a little bit from, from the content of what's going on in your mind and you realize I'm not that thought, I'm not that emotion, it's happening within me, but I'm, I, I'm also something bigger than that. And then the second uh, stage is where you work with loving kindness, just how you've just described it, where you envelope whatever content you find in your mind with compassion, with love, with forgiveness. Forgive you, give yourself, you forgive others. And you, you, you know, it's just like as if your mind is a baby and you just caress it and say, it's all good. You know, you can, you might be screaming here and you might be in pain, but I am like a mum and I'm holding you, I'm holding this pain, I caress it. And, and loving kindness is a slow healer. So it will help to transform the negativity, the pain in us in a slow way, it takes some time. And then the third tier is where you actually work with the chakras, which is much faster, where you, um, uh, let's just say, um, you know, I mean, you need to, practice with that you know you so you learn to kind of uh what do i say open a chakra and so let's say your heart chakra is full of uh, sorrow and loneliness and then you open it by imagining jesus or buddha is standing in front of you and you kind of make that connection with that deity and and through that union suddenly you experience a feeling of love and so all the pain all the sorrow from your heart is just gone in an instant and if you learn to trust in that and refocus on that repeatedly then that becomes the new you so you, you've already saved yourself 10,000 hours of psychoanalysis you know which couldn't achieve that in all of these hours and loving kindness will also achieve that but much in a much longer period of time and when you're good at chakra work you can do that quite quickly you know you can make big changes very quickly and the fourth tier is where you can bring all of these three tiers together in, in an instant. So you're, you're observant, relaxed, loving, you open the chakra all in an instant, elegantly, effortlessly. And that's what they call Dzogchen or Ati Yoga. And where, where you're just really good at all of this. this is really, it's not an extra tier, it's just a culmination of the first three tiers. Interesting, so what you're saying, what you're pointing out there, I think, is you're saying that uh, working on things psychologically, like through loving kindness to yourself, uh, it's almost like you're working on like a, a sort of, um, it's uh, on a layer, which is slower to work on. Whereas if you're working on the energetic layer using the chakras, it's maybe more direct access to the actual energy currents themselves, therefore it's faster kind of thing to work with. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so if you if you just imagine, um, you know, you have your baby and it's screaming and you just caress it and you carry it around and you give it lots and lots of love, eventually it will calm down. But if you somehow, for some reason, know exactly what the baby needs and you give it to it, you know, because sometimes babies scream and you, you don't know what's wrong with them and you give them food and you give them, you change the nappy, nothing changes. But somehow you can, you know what the, what the baby needs. You give it to him and it stops screaming immediately. That's the chakra work. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your, your new book, which is the um, Higher Consciousness Healing Book. <clears throat> and one of the things I like about the Higher Conscious Healing Book is um, really it's just the simplicity of it. It seems to me that it does a really good job of like... Um, because you know for example in the enlightenment through kundalini book um it's there's a lot of quite esoteric practices in that book which are really cool and i've done all of them and i think they're awesome but what's interesting about the uh the higher consciousness healing book is is really focused down onto one practice uh, which is which is really seems to be focused around generating a symbolic idea um which is from higher consciousness and then meditating on that on that symbol, and yes. um, it's funny because you know I always had problems when I was meditating with the heart chakra. I just didn't I didn't really understand what the heart chakra was, um, and uh, 
I've got some I've got some ideas about that, which I'll but uh, but before I get to that, like just that idea. So what I did the practice of the of finding finding a symbol um, about a month ago, I think, and just meditating on that symbol in the heart chakra. It just it, it was really funny because I'm really used to going through all the chakras and like like really cultivating like each petal and like getting really detailed with energy cultivation in each chakra. Uh, but the amazing thing about the symbolic idea just in the heart chakra is it really astonished me how powerful it was. It just generated this like huge field of white light, which was so blissful. It just gen it came right out of my chest and like right up to my third eye. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. And what was cool about it is incredibly simple. You don't have to think too much about it. You just think, you just focus on this idea and um Damn, that was really good. And the funny thing is, is I before I was reading that book, I'd been reading something about um, another Buddhist thing. I think it was about Judge Judgin or Judgin, one of these Buddhist uh, traditions where the practice seems to be based on just focusing on the energy of the heart chakra. And it seemed to me there was maybe some kind of similarity there. And um, yeah, so maybe explain about the higher consciousness healing. So the higher consciousness healing really works on all three levels that I've just explained. So we focus on the symbol or on the symbol of the higher consciousness itself. Um, yeah. and that helps us to anchor our mind to become calm and peaceful, like on the Hinayana level, you know, what, what a lot of mindfulness practices are all about. And then we um, combine that with a strong um, practice of loving kindness towards ourselves and particularly to those people who have harmed us and so, through that giving love to those who have harmed us we can get free of all the traumas of our past you know people can't believe it but it's true you know if even if you had severe traumas through the the um, work of loving kindness towards exactly those people you can, you reach uh, some sort of moral high ground from which you can truly and genuinely let that suffering go from that past and all the PTSD will go away. And then we also work in the, in the third or fourth step with the, um, with the chakras directly. So if you have anxiety, you, you learn to um, relax and release the anxiety at the chakra where the problem is or depression or anger. And so basically that chakra, that meditation or this practice um, works on all of those three levels. And, and it is very comprised and it is actually quite simple and even children can do it. And, uh, and I've worked with thousands of people with this practice and you know it has reduced you know, anxiety. Let's say people come to me, I have decades of anxiety or severe clinical depression. You know, the, the, these feelings, these bad states of mind that go away within weeks, months, maybe one or two months. It is very, very powerful. And sometimes people, you know, I've heard people saying, oh, clearly you don't know what clinical depression is. It's not, it's not true. You know, I've had a number of clients who were really in a bad state of depression or in a very bad situation. And it also works on relationships. You know, it clarifies relationships because we, we, we are visualizing uh, our aura and our clear boundary around us and the boundaries of other people so that we avoid getting enmeshed with other people which is really the problem which you get a lot where, where, where you know you kind of get mixed up with another person and you don't know is this my problem or their problem who's dominating whom here who's the bad person who's the good person? it's all confused and when you just visualize this circle around you or this ball around you all of this becomes quite clear quite quickly so um yes um, it is quite a very powerful, very, very effective practice for all sorts of problems. I wonder, I wonder if there's limitations to it. Like, you know, um, I was, I'm, uh, I've got a group on Facebook where I started off helping people who had had sort of traumatic experiences from ayahuasca or other drugs, you know, because like, I suddenly realized that, hey, it's not just me. There might be other people who are like, had their, been blown open, you know? So I started trying to help people about eight years ago and, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big group now, you know, like 12,000 people or whatever. But like, the funny thing is, is like, um, from time to time, pretty regularly, you get people coming on and they're saying, you know, um, 
you know, it's uh, we live in the matrix, the world's a simulation. Uh, we're actually being manipulated by archons and reptilians and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's a, it's a very compelling narrative, all this stuff, you know, it's, a, it's very compelling. And, um, and yet, you know, like, uh, and yet you don't hear any great masters really talking about that all that much. You know, if you listen to like uh, uh, Seven and or any of these great, uh, great yogic masters, you, you rarely hear them talking about the, the problem with the simulation of the matrix, the reptilians or whatever it is. And so I think that, you know, like, um, I sometimes wonder if those kind of worldviews are, 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 are sort of, they're sort of dependent upon, um, they're, they're, they're based primarily uh, upon like uh, unhappiness with the social order, but also with a sort of negative chakra vibrational uh, state. Where I think if you if you serve in a negative vibrational state, you tend to see observe negative aspects of what reality is. And I wonder, like um, for example, like for example, the world's a mess. It seems like it's a big mess all of a sudden. It's so it's a mess. I just I just survived from coronavirus this week. I almost died last week. It was oh, unbelievable. Dear. Oh yeah, it was unbelievable. But I used an alternative medicine called ivermectin, which wiped out. But on the internet, everybody says it's illegal. You can't use it. It saved my life, thank God. But there's, there's all. But my point is, is the whole of society just seems like it's so chaotic and it's so corrupt. And I just don't think political activism can do anything. You can't do anything. Nobody can be trusted. Except, I wonder. I, <laughs> I wonder, like with. Uh, considering that a lot of these ideas are sort of dependent on negative chakra projections, I think, yes. is like, could, could a simple, could a simple practice, like, like the, the healing consciousness practice, is that powerful enough to change? See, I just don't think it's worth doing political. I, I don't, I'm not gonna get in the streets and argue with any policeman about anything. I think the thing to do is, is focus yeah. on a symbol and heal the world symbolically. Well, what I will say, Scott, if if somebody wants to do the higher consciousness healing, I I would really my bet is they will get a lot of benefit from it. But if somebody is in a mindset where they say everything is the matrix and we are dominated by reptiles and or reptilians or whatever, and um and and they are in a way either in a complete psychotic state or in some some very angry conspiracy uh, state, then, then they probably don't even want to use a practice like higher consciousness healing. And if you don't use it, obviously it can't help you. But as, as soon as people try to do it, I, will, I would think they, they would uh, gain some benefit. There are exceptions from that. So if somebody is in a complete drug psychosis, yeah, and, 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 and in a way, drug psychosis is like dreaming a nightmare while you're awake, basically. And, well, they need to wait a little bit, you know. Drug psychosis dissolves by itself. I used to be a drug counselor, by the way. So I had a lot, I talked to a lot of people in drug psychosis. You know, the good thing about drug psychosis is it subsides by itself. Every month you feel a bit better. And after a year, hopefully you will be okay. And uh, probably traumatized by the experience, but the actual psychosis will be gone. Now, obviously, if somebody is in an acute psychosis, they, they will not benefit from this. I can understand that. But you talked about the matrix and how um, spiritual teachers don't talk about it. Tibetan Buddhism definitely talks about that a lot. You know, they really? don't call it the matrix, they call it the dream. So, so we are encouraged to see the world that we see around us as a dream. And uh, if we see a horrible world, then we, we are meant to say to ourselves, I'm dreaming a nightmare. And the nightmare is coming from my own mind. You know, we are always encouraged to take responsibility for how we, what we see around us. It's just like the environment, it's like a mirror. And if we see just horror and ho horrible things around us, it's a reflection of, of our own mind. And, you know, the teaching is that if you're, if you're enlightened, that you see this very world as a kind of paradise, you know, which is a, you know, the conditioned world, samsara becomes nirvana, it's no different. And, uh, and, you know, they say you hear every sound as a mantra, you see every, every being as a, as a Buddha, 
and you you can dream a very very positive dream and the way you do that is to, to change the state of your chakras because the chakras are like old-fashioned cinema projectors they're projecting movies out there and you what you're seeing around you is that movie that you're projecting out from your own chakras and uh and, and if you see just horror and sorrow and and so forth then then you have to look at your own chakras and say well maybe i i need to get myself into a better place and then you know what i see around me then i can see also that yes there are maybe some confused people and also bad people but there are also plenty of wonderful people and and those who try doing good even though maybe they don't always know what's good but they're trying and it's not not quite so bad and and you find plenty of wonderful things to look at yeah I think it's a much more positive, like it's a much more positive way to live, right? If you're coming from that place where it's actually got the potential of every sound is a mantra. I, I much prefer that to the idea that like we're trapped in a prison planet or whatever the hell it is this week, you know, interesting. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting you were a drugs counselor. Um, and I know we're running up on the hour here, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna try and wrap this up quickly here. But like, um, you know, I did um, I was doing the ayahuasca, and like I don't know if you know much about the. I'm just gonna tell you this because because I'm going to do it. Um, I don't know if you know much about ayahuasca, but it's like the Rosetta Stone. Uh, it's like the Rosetta Stone plant uh, f uh, for shamans in the Amazon. And so what happens is once you've done ayahuasca a bunch of times. Uh, a lot of the shamans in the jungle, they start taking other plants. And that's what I did too. I end up taking lots of these other plants. And what happens is because you've done ayahuasca, you start being able to communicate with these other plants. And they start, so what happened to me is I would have like dreams, which I would wake up from dreams and all of a sudden I'd be getting these downloads of cures for how to cure people and, uh, and like uh, being shown how to, to basically healing stuff. Sometimes you'd get stuff to try and tempt you and do do evil or whatever, but um, it's I just I just wanted to mention it because I don't know if it's like widely known like um, with because I think a lot of times people hear about ayahuasca or like it, it oftentimes gets lumped into like drugs like oh it's a drug, but it's but it's actually part of like this sort of spiritual ecosystem. It's just it's just unbelievable, and so there's there's. There's these huge trees in the Amazon, which actually get chopped down by Chinese company to be used for flooring. But if you like drink, um, drink the liquid from the trees, you can end up communicating, communicating with their spirits and finding out about the jungle and all these things. And it's, I think the whole world, and you know this, I guess, um, more generally, because I'm guessing you haven't been involved with Amazonian shamanism, but it seems like the world, um, like you're saying, it's it's much more uh, beautiful. It's much more exciting. It's so filled with possibilities, which the world is not awake to. And so in some ways, like, um, I don't know. I don't know how you feel. I mean, you've been helping people like with Kundalini issues, but it's almost like for me, it's almost like I'm trying to think of a way of like, how can I open people's eyes to this to the beautiful possibilities that exist in this world? Um, because we're so blind, generally by default. Yeah. And uh, well, the, the thing is, as a, as a drugs counselor, as well as a, as a Kundalini counselor, I always meet people who have had experiences with substances and healing plants or, or, or cannabis or, you know, you name it. I always get the accidents. So, yeah. um, <laughs> I, I rarely meet somebody who says I had a no it's not true sometimes I also meet people who say I had taken LSD and I had a picture of Kundalini awakening so that happens too and uh, so the, the, the problem I see with these substances whatever name you put on them it doesn't really matter is it, it can go both ways you know it can it, it can facilitate a Kundalini experience it can open you up and that can start a beautiful journey and that's a good thing but it can equally go in the other direction and um you know you get psychotic and you you know i have got clients who are basically traumatized by by some terrible lsd trip taken 20 years ago 
and the life yeah. is pretty much ruined by that. And yeah. if you know people like that, you just feel like, I don't want to touch this. This is yeah. much, much risk for me. And <coughs> speaking for myself, I, I'm pretty sure I had so many amazing, extreme experiences, never taking any drugs, you know, but I've had all of that without them. And, uh, and, and I know, you know, you, you can have these experiences without taking drugs. And I personally would prefer that. It's just much safer, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I, everybody needs to make their own decisions, so. <laughs> interesting. Hey, um, listen, Tara, that was, that was a really nice chat we just had. That was really interesting. And I'm really happy that I got to talk to you. Because, like, it's funny because, you know, like, that book, that Enlightenment, the kundalini book was really important like i don't know when you wrote that i think it was six or seven years ago i read it but it was like man that was an important book at the time so it was fun rereading it just before we started chatting i read it i reread it again yesterday and that's one good thing about your books too is they're actually they're full of information and they're sharp so you don't have to like wade through hundreds of pages and there's also a lot of nice stuff in there because there's a lot of like case studies which uh, put the abstract concepts into sort of a practical context, which mm -hmm. people might find interesting because on my channel, a few people go through this stuff too. So they might, uh, I'm recommending you, I'm recommending you. That's very kind of you. I've, I've also written uh, another book now, which is called Healing Kundalini Symptoms. And that's a very practical book for all sorts of problems that people can experience on that path. It is. You know, the, the first book, um, Enlightenment Through the Path of Kundalini, it's very esoteric, you know, very highbrow, so to speak. But Healing Kundalini Symptoms is a very practical book. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have so much theory and lots and lots of exercises uh, to the point that has worked for hundreds of people. And it's pretty, pretty much a distillation of, of my work with my clients. And, and, you know, what I know works for lots of people you know, if they get horror visions, if they get strong anxiety, if they get, you know, it's like, you know, the problems with ghosts and spurs, what to do about that. And so that's all in there. So healing Kundalini symptoms, that, that's um, another book that your viewers might be interested in. Nice. I'll link it below the uh, video. But uh, thanks so much for coming on, Tara. Yeah, it was real, a real pleasure talking to you. And um uh, hopefully, hopefully get to chat another day because it was really, uh, it was really, uh, I learned a couple of things here. It was good. Got some free stuff. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm going to start the recording. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Uh, recording. Stop. Bah.